December 20th, 1943, over the cold waters of the English Channel. AB-17 Flying Fortress, known as Lucky Strike, limped home like a wounded beast, refusing to die. Its number three engine was going to ripped clean off by anti-aircraft fire somewhere over Bremen, leaving a gaping wound in the wing. Streams of hydraulic fluid painted red streaks along the fuselage, and the ball turret hung at a sickening angle, its gunner already lost. By every rule of aerodynamics and every flight manual the Army Air Forces had published, the bomber should have crashed into the sea 20 minutes earlier. But it didn't. Pilot Lieutenant Marcus Webb fought the controls with a mix of muscle. Desperation and something else, something the ground crew had done weeks earlier, that wasn't written in any manual. When Lucky Strike finally touched the runway at RAF Bosenborn, it did so on one functioning landing gear. Sparks showered down the tarmac as the crippled plane skidded to a halt. Crash crews rushed forward expecting flames and bodies, but instead they found eight airmen climbing out on their own, dazed yet alive. The question that echoed across the airfield that night was a simple one. How did this plane stay in the air? The official reports would take months to complete, but the real answer was already at work two hangars away. Buried elbow deep inside another fortress engine cowling was a man who wasn't. T supposed to be their mechanic named Staff Sergeant Paul Zuck. He was the kind of man who believed that rules were suggestions and survival was a matter of creativity. What he'd been quietly doing to those planes would have gotten him court-martialed if anyone in authority had noticed. Yet, without his forbidden handiwork, Lucky Strike and countless other bombers might never have returned home. By the end of 1943, the United States Army Air Forces were facing a problem few dared to say out loud. Their beloved B-17s, the so-called flying fortresses, were going down at alarming rates. Some losses made since shot down by fighters or shredded by flak. Ah. But too many fell apart after seemingly minor hits. Hydraulic systems failed, fuel lines ruptured, electrical circuits shorted, and planes that looked airworthy simply fell from the sky. The aircraft that Boeing had promised was nearly indestructible was, in truth, fragile in all the wrong ways. Its design was efficient. Its systems beautifully arranged, but that efficiency meant that one hit to a key section could destroy everything at once. It wasn't just the Germans that were killing the fortresses, it was the design philosophy behind them. Zuck was never meant to fix airplanes. His personnel file said motor pool trucks, jeeps, ground vehicles, but someone at Basingbourne noticed his background. A mechanic from Pittsburgh who de-spent the Great Depression fixing coal trucks, delivery vans, and bootlegger cars with whatever scraps he could find. When he arrived in England in August 1943, he was 26 years old hands calloused, fingernails permanently black with grease, and armed with one simple rule. If it's broken, make it work. Within his first week on the flight line, he watched a fellow crew chief ground a bomber for a cracked hydraulic line. The part was on back order. The mission went out one aircraft short. Zook asked why they couldn't reroute pressure through a secondary line. The answer was the same every time. That's not in the manual. Zook's reply became famous among the mechanics. The manual didn't T grow up fixing trucks in Pittsburgh. I did. Unlike most of his peers, Zook didn't just fix problems, he reimagined them. When he looked at a damaged system, he asked a question engineers never did. What happens when this breaks over enemy territory? Thousands of feet above Germany, with no spare parts in sight? His genius wasn't academic, it was practical. By the fall of 1943, planes he had worked on started showing an unusual trend. They came back. Bombers that should have been lost managed to limp home. Hydraulics still functioned after hits. Fuel kept flowing even through damaged wings, and electrical systems stayed alive when others went dark. The crews called it luck. <sighs> Zuck called it good plumbing. The truth was brutal. The B-17's hydraulic system, which controlled the landing gear, brakes, flaps, and even gun turrets, was designed for efficiency, not survivability. All the main pressure lines were routed neatly together through the fuselage. It looked good on a blueprint. But one well-placed flak fragment could sever every critical function in seconds. The fuel system was just as dangerous nine tanks. Thousands of gallons of high-octane gasoline and feed lines that ran straight through the most vulnerable parts of the airframe. A single bullet could turn the aircraft into a flying torch, or worse, introduce air bubbles that caused engines to sputter out one by one. 
Boeing's design worked beautifully in a laboratory. It just wasn't built for war. So Zuck decided to rebuild it. He scavenged tubing from wrecked bombers in the scrapyard and pressure tested them by hand. He rerouted hydraulic lines along the edges of the fuselage, creating messy but redundant pathways that ensured a single hit couldn't disable the entire system. He installed manual valves that pilots could switch in mid-air to isolate damaged lines. For fuel, he added crossover valves that allowed crews to cut off leaking tanks and feed engines from alternate sources. And for electricity, he built a secret network of backup circuits from the auxiliary generator straight to critical instruments and turrets, hidden inside existing bundles so no inspector would notice. Even marked the breakers with yellow insulation so air crews would know which switches controlled the lifelines. By January 1944, 17 bombers in Zuck's group carried his modifications. Officially, they were untouched. Unofficially, they were miracles in waiting. Then came the inspection. Captain Ronald Fletcher, an engineering officer, randomly opened an access panel on a B-17 called Devil's Daughter and froze. Inside, he found a jungle of extra tubing, manual valves, and custom wiring that no Boeing engineer had ever designed. Fletcher stormed into the hangar to confront Zook. Sergeant, he barked, care to explain why there are 40 feet of unauthorized hydraulic line in my aircraft? Zook didn't even look up from his work. You want the official answer, or the real one? Fletcher soon realized this wasn't a one-off. Seventeen planes had been modified. He was furious until he checked the combat records. Not one of those seventeen bombers had been lost to hydraulic or fuel system failure. Three had taken direct hits that should have doomed them. All three returned home. By noon, the matter had reached Colonel James Albertson, the same man who'd watched Lucky Strike slide across the runway in December. He personally inspected Zook's work and understood what he was looking at insubordination that saved lives. The Army Air Forces launched an official investigation led by Major Henry Watkins and two Boeing engineers. The civilians were horrified. Everything Zuck had done violated standard design principles. The lead engineer, a man named Carlson, spent an hour explaining why the modifications couldn't possibly function. Safely, Zuck waited until he was done and asked a single question. When S, the last time you flew through flak? Carlson said nothing. Watkins proposed a bold idea, test the modifications in combat. In March 1944, five of Zook's aircraft flew 11 missions to Berlin, Brunswick, and Friedrichshafen, each fitted with sensors to measure pressure, fuel flow, and electrical output. Three of them took battle damage. All five came home. On March 18th, during the raid on Friedrichshafen, Memphis Belta took a direct flak hit that shredded its primary hydraulic line. Within seconds, system pressure dropped to zero. The pilot followed Zuck's instructions, flipped three manual valves, and pressure stabilized at 85%. A bomber completed its mission and landed safely back at base. When the engineers reviewed the data, Carlson stared in disbelief. This shouldn't work, he said. The flow rates are wrong, the filters are inadequate, but it works. Zuck, its quiet reply said it all. That S because I built it to work when everything S already gone to hell. The test results were undeniable. Watkins' final report concluded that Zuck's modifications increased combat survivability without impairing normal function. Translation, he'd made the B-17 better without breaking it. By April, field manuals were quietly rewritten to include versions of his fixes. And other mechanics began replicating his work across England. Boeing would later adopt similar redundancies in its future bomber designs. Zook never received a medal, but the planes he touched gained a reputation for doing the impossible returning home when every other fortress fell. In the grand machinery of war, where engineers built by numbers and factories by speed, one grease-covered mechanic from Pittsburgh proved that survival isn't about perfection, it's about resilience. The B-17 Flying Fortress became a legend not because of its design, but because of the men who refused to accept that good enough was good enough. And somewhere in a cold English hangar, Paul Zook kept working late into the night, flashlight in his teeth, making sure that the next bomber and its crew had a fighting chance to come home.